Our keynote speaker today is His Highness uh, uh, Faisal bin Farhan Al Saud, advisor to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, normally I would tell everyone to review the written materials for more detail and that I would summarize. However, our keynote speaker is so um, low-key and so humble uh, that there's very little written uh, on him or about him. So I uh, had to poke around a little bit to determine to, and talk with him a little bit about uh, and do a little due diligence. After studying the business administration at King Saud University, he became chairman of Al Salam Aircraft Company in 2000, and he f uh, founded uh, Shamal Investment Company in 2004. Um, until his appointment last month to serve as advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he had been chairman of Shamal, a holding company where he established and, and oversaw five successful companies in the defense sector. In addition to his success as an entrepreneur and business leader, Prince Faisal is a respected leader in the kingdom on foreign policy issues. His voice is one of the most respected in the royal court on U.S.-Saudi relations, and his following on Twitter for commentary on foreign policy issues affecting the kingdom is among the most substantial. In fact, many have referred to him as a, quote, Twitter star, end quote. Last month, His Majesty King Salman appointed Prince Faisal as advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In that capacity, I'm sure we will all be seeing and hearing much more from him here in Washington over the coming months and years. Please join me in welcoming our keynote luncheon speaker, Prince Faisal bin Farhan Al Saud. I would like to thank the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington for hosting this event and inviting me to present this keynote address. And th <clears throat> sorry, I'm happy to see such a large audience, and I understand the event was well oversubscribed. I believe the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has an excellent story to tell, even if we have often been ineffective at telling it. We're trying to adjust that, and hopefully this event and others will contribute to a better understanding. About one year ago, King Salman approved a far-reaching set of strategic goals for the future of the kingdom. Vision 2030, led by, led by His Royal Highness, the Deputy Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, establ established a direction of travel for the kingdom towards a path of sustained prosperity for the people of Saudi Arabia. Today, one year into our journey, we have a better grasp of the challenges and opportunities we face. After the vision was announced, the first 12 months have been focused on developing detailed programs and initiatives necessary to achieve the vision's broader objectives. We have had five-year plans before with many ambitious goals, similar to those outlined in Vision 2030. What's exciting this time is the vision's commitment to a set of measurable and clearly defined goals Specific accountability mechanisms and relevant stakeholders for each objective have been identified, and they will be judged constantly to ensure success. As we diversify our economy, we intend to triple non oil revenue to $141 billion by 2020 and create 450,000 new non governmental jobs. And as we introduce policies to empower the private sector, our goal is to increase its contribution to gross domestic product from 40 to 65 percent. We also intend to empower women to play a more prominent role by increasing women's participation in the workforce from 22 to 30 percent, among other goals. Twenty, Ten years ago, seeing women participate in government meetings was uncommon. Today, when I go to meetings at government agencies, I'm more likely than not to see several women participating in the decision-making process. <coughs> the IPO of Saudi Aramco has taken a lion's share of the focus of observers, but we also have plans to privatize significant state-owned enterprises valued at close to $200 billion. This effort aims to promote efficiency and generate revenue to be reinvested in new industries. We also have plans to develop the $1.5 trillion of untapped mineral reserves. This will not only provide jobs, 
it will also create significant opportunities for new industries. More than one and a half million Muslims make the Hajj pilgrimage every year. Beyond the two holy sites, the kingdom also is blessed with diverse natural beauty and a cultural and archaeological heritage spanning 6,000 years. This fertile ground for a vibrant tourism industry will provide significant economic opportunities within the framework of the vision. Tourism and hospitality are only two of our economy's emerging and expanding sectors. In industry after industry, we are growing businesses and generating jobs. Another focus of our transformation is the development of opportunities for the arts and entertainment. This will provide economic as well as social benefits. Foreign investors have a formidable partner, the Saudi Public Investment Fund, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. It finances projects to diversify economy at home and to generate returns abroad. The fund will seek investments in new technologies as well as investments with strategic value to the kingdom, strategic value to the kingdom's e economic transformation. There are 755 initiatives in the National Transformation Program for the first five years. We won't succeed at everything on the first try, but we are learning. One of the key elements of the vision, and one of the things that has given me personally the most, and I come from the private sector, and one of the things that's encouraged me is the willingness to constantly review and to understand when we've made mistakes, when the government has made mistakes, and adjust in the middle of the program. There is no pride involved. It is really all focused on achieving the end goals. We are asking policymakers and opinion leaders to support these initiatives and American businesses and investors, as well as those from China, Japan, and other potential economic partners to participate in them. Vision 2030 is not just a program for economic reform. It is a true effort at national transformation. We aim to create a more vibrant, thriving, vi vibrant society, thriving economy, and an ambitious nation. I'll talk a little bit about U.S.-Saudi relations. Saudi Arabia and the U.S. have had a strategic relationship for more than 70 years. This relationship has paid strong dividends for both, and based on the strong shared interests, we have worked together for stability in the Middle East and beyond. We are keen to see this continue. The 2030 plan includes provisions for strategic partnerships into the 21st century, and one of our main strategic partners will be the United States. And in that regard, we are keen to see the cooperation, both on the investment side and the foreign policy side, taken to new levels of an institutional nature. We are focused on the strategic partnership while still understanding the need to do more ourselves. And that is part of the dialogue that we are having with the United States, and we understand that as a growing nation, as a nation with importance in the region, we have the responsibility to carry our burden, and we will do so. But we want to do so in partnership with the US. And I think it has proven resilient and will continue to do so. Thank you. What kind of help would you like to see the United States give you in Yemen now, today? Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, in Yemen, I think we've started an important dialogue with the U.S. right now, and uh, the primary resource we're asking for is better intelligence sharing. Uh, obviously, we're also seeking uh, the continued provision of uh, precision munitions, which are very important to reducing the, uh, the risk of collateral damage in that conflict. And obviously, we're also keen to see more support in interdicting the flow of Iranian-supplied we weapons to the Houthis. Those are the three main issues. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, I have a question on the um, 2030 strategy. Um, does it include anything that has to do with promoting a moderate Islam around the world? Uh, not around the world. Uh, 2030 is primarily focused on the domestic scene, but uh, it does contain an element of building a national character, and that includes emphasizing the moderate uh, Islamic mm, principles that I th you know, we feel we are uh, adherent to, and to bring those into the fore and make sure that any extremist voices are uh, marginalized and pushed out of the scene. 
that, so that's for the domestic side, not the international. Do you have any idea of what this threshold the, the United States is looking for from Saudi Arabia to quote unquote pay their fair share? You'd have to ask the Trump administration specifically, but I think, you know, our opinion is that we are paying our fair share and we are, as I mentioned, in a constant dialogue with this administration as we passed to make sure that we are uh, doing what is necessary to maintain the stability in the region. I think these are shared interests. The U.S. has an interest there as well, but we are, you know, we are playing our role and we are open to playing a bigger role as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Judith Kipper. Uh, the uh, Deputy Crown Prince said a few days ago that no uh, dialogue was possible uh, with Iran. Obviously, the Iranian-Saudi uh, tension is a tremendous concern, not only in the region, but here in uh, Washington and all over the world. Wouldn't dialogue be a good idea? After all, Iran is a huge country of 85 million people. Comparatively, Saudi is a small country, and to reach some kind of detente and way of living uh, with each other, uh, is a dialogue going to be uh, essential? Uh, thank you, Judith. Uh, Iran is an Im important country. It's a big country for sure, but the current regime has left very little room for dialogue. Saudi Arabia and Iran had a very strong relation, a good relationship before 1979. After 1979, there have been several attempts at dialogue between the kingdom and Iran, uh, some of them worked temporarily, but in the end, they always failed because of Iran's tendency to want to export the revolution, want to impose its will on the region, and that makes it very difficult. You know, is there prospects for dialogue in the future? Is Iran gonna change? Are they gonna change their constitution where they no longer make export of the revolution a part of their national principles? I don't know, I would hope that Iran would moderate and then be a worthy partner for dialogue. But at the current time, it doesn't seem so.